We've previously illustrated the deadweight loss from a distortionary tax in the consumer diagram. We started with the good x1 that's going to be taxed, modeled dollars of other consumption, a composite good on the vertical axis, and started with an original untaxed budget constraint, where the slope of that budget constraint is just minus p1, since the price of dollars of other consumption is just a dollar. Then when the tax is imposed, the price of the good increases. So now the price is P1 plus the increase in the price that's due to the tax. So we have a steeper budget constraint. And to derive the deadweight loss, we said we need to compare how much in tax revenue we actually raised under the distortionary tax and how much we could have raised had we not distorted the prices. So in order to know how much tax revenue we raise after the tax is imposed, we have to figure out what's the consumer going to do after the tax is imposed. So we have to figure out the optimal bundle the consumer chooses on the after-tax budget, so some bundle A. Then we saw that we could measure the tax revenue as just the difference in the dollars you were able to consume in other consumption when the tax was imposed and the dollars you could have consumed had you not paid your taxes and consumed the same amount of the good x1. So this difference, this vertical difference, was the tax revenue that we raised under the distortionary tax. Then we compared that to a lump sum tax, a tax where we simply took cash away from you without distorting the prices and we asked how much cash could we take away from you, how much could we shift that green budget in parallel and make you no worse off than you are under the distortionary tax. So we shifted that green budget until it was tangent to the after-tax indifference curve and the vertical distance between the green and the blue budget was the amount we could raise from you in cash since we're measuring this axis in dollars and we could measure that anywhere since the two lines are parallel including right here so we saw that the amount that we could have raised this difference was larger than the tax revenue that we actually raised and we called that the lump sum amount that we could have raised from you and then the difference between those two was our deadweight loss. So now that we know about compensated demand curves or marginal willingness to pay curves, we can derive what that deadweight loss looks like in a marginal willingness to pay graph. Notice that we have two points, the point A and this point B that we got to with the lump sum tax. They're both tangent to the same indifference curve. So we derive marginal willingness to pay curves from a single indifference curve. So we can bring down the point B. The point B happens on the shallower budget, the budget with the price that doesn't have the tax in it. So it happens at P1. And we can bring, so this is point B. And then we can bring down point A. That happens on the budget that's steeper, the one that includes the tax. So a higher price, that's P1 plus T. So there's our point A. So when we connect these, we get the marginal willingness to pay curve that's derived from this indifference curve. Let's call that UA, since it contains the point A. So it's the marginal willingness to pay curve that corresponds to you consuming at bundle A, the indifference curve that you're on when you're at bundle A. So now we have a marginal willingness to pay curve and we know how to measure consumer surplus along marginal willingness to pay curves. So we can measure the consumer surplus with the tax. So with the tax as just the area above that price up to the marginal willingness to pay curve. So that's the, a the area A. We can also measure consumer surplus at the lower price when you're taxed in a lump sum way. So their consumer surplus is A 
B and C. So the consumer surplus with the lump sum tax is A plus B plus C. But wait a second. How can we have more consumer surplus when we are on the same marginal earnings to pay curve that corresponds to the same indifference curve? Aren't we equally happy at point A and point B? Indeed, we are equally happy. We're on the same indifference curve. And yet we're getting more consumer surplus at point B than we did at point A. Well, what we haven't taken into account is that you had to give a bunch of, a bunch of cash up to get to point B. We took a bunch of cash away from you. So the amount of cash we must have taken away from you is an amount that makes you indifferent between being at A and B because they're both on the same indifference curve. So if you're getting B plus C more consumer surplus under the lump sum tax, the amount of cash we took away from you must be exactly equal to B plus C. That's how you become indifferent between the two. So we can conclude that this implies that L the amount we took away from you as a lump sum tax is equal to B plus C. The amount that makes us indifferent between getting the additional consumer surplus but having to give up cash and not getting the additional consumer surplus and getting that higher price. So now we have L in this graph. L is just the area B plus C. So to figure out where the dead weight loss is, all we have to figure out is where it, where's T? How much tax do you actually pay under the, lump, under the distortionary tax? Well, under the distortionary tax, you pay this difference between the original price and the new price. That's how much tax you pay per unit. And you're buying this many units at point A under the distortionary tax. So if we multiply the per unit tax, the difference in the prices, times how much you pay under the distortionary tax, we get the area B. So you're paying this tax per unit times this many units. That gives us this rectangle. So that's how much of a tax you pay under the distortionary tax. And the deadweight loss is just the difference between what we could have raised from you and what we actually raised from you. That's just our definition of deadweight loss. That gives us that little distance in between those two as the deadweight loss. So here we have deadweight loss. So now that we know what these areas are, T is B, L is B plus C, so if we subtract from B plus C, B, we just get the little area C. So that triangle becomes our deadweight loss in this picture. That area must be exactly equal to this distance up here. Now we also said when we first talked about deadweight loss from taxes that since these, this difference between L and T emerges purely from a substitution effect, the deadweight loss is arising from a substitution effect. So when we take the substitution effect away, the deadweight loss should go away. We showed that in this picture of the consumer diagram by saying let's remove the substitution effect by making the preferences perfect complements. So perfect complements have these L-shaped indifference curves. So if we replicate this picture we have some original without tax budget. Turns out that that budget is irrelevant for our dead weight loss calculation because what we need to do is we need to go to the after-tax budget and figure out where that point A is. But now we're going to assume perfect complements. So point A is the optimal point, but the indifference curve doesn't have any substitutability built into it, so there'll be no substitution effect. The tax revenue that we collect is the difference between how much in other goods consumption we were able to do while paying our tax and how much we would have been able to do if we hadn't paid our tax. So that's T. If we then ask, well, how much cash could we take away from you without making you any worse off? Since there's no substitutability built into this indifference curve, when we shift that green budget to be tangent to the 
L-shaped indifference curve, it would go straight through point A. So point A becomes equal to point B. And the vertical distance between the green and the blue budget is just equal to what the tax revenue was before. Now what we could have raised and what we actually raised is the same, so there is no deadweight loss. What would that look like on the lower picture where we derive the marginal willingness to pay curve? Well, we would want to bring down point A. Point A happens at the higher prices, the prices with the tax. Point B happens at the same quantity of x1. So if we bring down point B, we'd bring it down at the same quantity. But point B happens at the lower price, at the without distortionary tax price, where we've taken the cash from the lump sum tax away from you. So here we've got our point A. Here we've got our point B. Our marginal willingness to pay curve is now a vertical line. So we have a marginal willingness to pay curve corresponding to the indifference curve we're on at point A. And now we can find those same areas. We'll find the area A, that's our consumer surplus with the tax. We find the area A plus B, that's the consumer surplus with the lump sum tax. So that would be A plus B. But there is no little area C. So the lump sum tax is going to be equal to B. There is no little area C. Because we're equally happy at point A and point B, but we get little b more consumer surplus at the lower price when we had to give up cash. So to be, to be indifferent between those two points, it has to be that we must have given up something of value little b well, that was the cash we had to give up to pay the lump sum tax. That made us indifferent between A and B. That's why the lump sum tax is equal to B. But the tax revenue we collect is the per unit tax times how much we buy is also equal to B. So the lump sum area, so in this case, L would be equal to B. The tax revenue under the distortionary tax is also equal to B. So the deadweight loss is equal to L minus T, which is just equal to zero in this case. So we see again that when we take away the substitutability in preferences, the deadweight loss goes away. The greater the substitutability, the farther part A and B are going to be the farther part A and B are going to be down here, and so the bigger that triangle, that deadweight loss triangle, is going to get.